like to welcome all of you to the ruptures, African Studies and the Racial Politics of Knowledge Production, 1968 to 1999 Roundtable. This is the first of two sequential roundtables this morning that are intended to extend and deepen the conversation that Jean Allman reopened in her presidential lecture last night and I would argue um, has written a new chapter uh, in the history of this organization. This kind of critical introspection is especially urgent in our present moment, and we are fortunate to be joined in this conversation by such a distinguished group of scholars. Before we begin, a short word about the format for today. I will introduce each panelist immediately ahead of their brief, in fact, preposterously brief <laughs> opening <laughs> remarks. So we've asked, um, we've asked each panelist to speak uh, initially for five minutes because we really want this to be um, a conversation. Uh, and so after the um, opening remarks, we will enter into that conversation and we invite the audience to uh, participate in that. So the common question that each of our panelists has been asked to consider for today's roundtable is the following. Over the last half century, the ASA has experienced a series of ruptures around questions of race, representation, and knowledge production. These ruptures prompted some changes in policy during the association's early years, but since then they have spurred episodic debate rather than radical transformation. The unfinished business of 1968-69, it seems, lurks just beneath the surface of our associational life, even as the ASA looks considerably different today than it did 60 years ago. 60 years after the ASA's founding, 50 years after the Los Angeles and Montreal meetings, and almost 25 years after Curtin's ghettoizing African history, the ASA and African studies more broadly in the US remain sites where knowledge production, institutional power, and professional opportunities and advancement are shaped by race in profoundly unequal ways. What lessons from the past have gone unheeded to make this state of affairs possible? So that's the common question. So what I'd like to do now um, is introduce our first panelist. Dr. Shelby Faye Lewis is Professor Emerita at Clark Atlanta University. Her inter international career has included service as an education officer in Uganda, senior Fulbright scholar in Lesotho, CIES board member, Fulbright Specialist, International Development Specialist for USAID, UNDP, and various universities, and as Vice Chair of the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. She also served as Founding Director of the Doctoral Program in Africana Women's Studies and the International Center at Clark Atlanta, and managed university partnerships and programs in 32 countries for the United Negro College Fund Special Programs. She was a Black Caucus participant at the ASA Conference in Los Angeles, 1968, Montreal, 1969, and a member of the 1973-74 AHSA ASA delegation at the International African Studies Meeting in Addis Ababa. Dr. Lewis co-founded both AHSA and the National Council of Black Political Scientists and served as president of both associations. Welcome, Dr. Shelby Faye Lewis. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. I'm still on uh, West Coast time. Um, I want to begin by thanking Dr. Alvin and her team for inviting me to this round table, for organizing it first and inviting me to participate. I also want to thank the team for building futures out of the uh, ruptures that ASA has had, building futures. But I finally want to congratulate her on that marvelous presentation she made last night. She got uh, five standing ovations, but would you join me in thanking her again? I have about five minutes. 
and I hope she didn't take those last few from me, uh, to uh, make some brief comments. She told you that um, Karen said that I was at the uh, Los Angeles meeting with the first rupture. I was in Montreal standing on the stage. I was uh, in Addis, and I have been involved with AHSA every year since then, as well as NCOPS. Um, I grew up in plain dealing Louisiana during, it's, it's in the Jim Crow, Crow South, and I was born early enough, and I'm not gonna tell you how early that was, to understand and to receive or experience uh, overt racism and exclusion. So I was prepared for Los Angeles. I understood the ideology and the uh, structure of racism. Uh, but I was not prepared for the first African studies course that I had because the professor was one of the fellows from ASA. And before taking that class, I thought I understood why there was racial uh, uh, discrimination and uh, the ideology was there. I assumed, because in plain dealing and in a segregated school, black students learned about W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, all of the others who worked in the area of African studies at least half a century before ASA was founded. But that information was denied the students in the white segregated schools. So I assumed their um, cultural deprivation in some way affected their racism. But when I went to this first class, this person was well informed but the racism was still there. In the lectures, you could hear it. Um, and there would be occasional, what I call, racial put-downs. And one of them is the reason the trajectory of my life changed and I really got involved on the continent of Africa. She said in one class that white Americans would be much better received in Africa than black Americans. And I had some problems with that premise. And I was in graduate school at the University of Massachusetts. I stopped and I joined a program at Columbia University called Teachers for East Africa. And I wanted to test that premise. I can assure you that I was warmly embraced in Uganda by the faculty, the teachers, um, the community, uh, by the British who were there as well. One little hiccup is the uh, headmaster of Cannon Bottomley had a military carriage and he said, well, she's an American, but after all, she's a Negro. But he and I got along fairly well and at Nabumali High School in Uganda. Uh, but that trajectory took me to Uganda and to at least 40 other African countries. And the ties that I established there are still with me today. I'm back and forth from Uganda. I'm getting emails from people in Uganda all the time. So I had to conclude that that particular professor's premise 
had no merit. And I did go to find that out. I concluded that it was not lack of information that caused that attitude. It was the wielding of power from white privilege that caused it. But I went on and uh, Dr. Alman did such a good job of talking about the first rupture and all of the things that happened. I want to talk just a little bit about what I call the second rupture because I um, experienced it a little bit differently than uh, it being a joint uh, group or delegation. Um, at the beginning, it was not a joint delegation. AHSA had a delegation, and ASA had a delegation, and the International um, African Studies Group said, we cannot seat more than one American delegation, which forced ASA and AHSA to get together to work it out. And as a result of that working out, and Halle Selassie, who was supporting AHSA, John Henry Clark, our president, became the head of the American delegation. And we call that one of the watershed moments for AHSA, because we got global recognition. This was in 1973. And it was indeed a rupture because ASA had always represented African studies in every arena. There was no other. And here we come to an arena, and this new upstart, AHSA, is there. And our president is made head of that delegation. So I think it was a rupture that was good, and I think both AHSA and ASA hopefully learn from that experience. One of the things that I find so interesting is the um, inability to find some way to place African studies, African American studies, diaspora studies together. Africana studies was an attempt, but people see it in a different category. And I think that's something we need to work on. Um, the things that were done uh, with the first rupture in Los Angeles, I think they were needed. I think they were good. And I think they uh, provided opportunities for members of ASA and AHSA to think long and hard about how we viewed what our approaches were, where we were going with African studies. And that's, that's really good. This, my, um, my mission, is that this is the first time I've been back to ASA since 1969 in Montreal. And it's, it's not because um, I'm holding grudges, it's because funds for travel are limited. And since I was on the founding board of AHSA. I chose AHSA for the conferences, and I was on the founding board of INCOATS. Well, two a year was about all I could handle, especially since I retired in 1995. So it's not because I don't like AHSA. 
it's because the opportunity could not be uh, taken advantage of because finances at institutions was low and my purse was not heavy. <laughs> Uh, the final thing that I want to say in this five minutes, that's the fastest five minutes I've ever seen, is that there are so many names and faces that we need to put together. And I think that this, well, these, round tables are bringing people together. I had not seen my friend from MIT for at least 10 or 15 years. You brought us together. There are other people that I haven't seen for a long time. You brought us together. I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate meeting many of you out here that I did not know. I think it's rich to know people and what they're doing. I, uh, I don't go many places these days where I uh, uh, find that they are none of my students. Uh, I've got them all over. And some of them have white hair too. And I, I, I uh, generally say, Oh, I think you're wrong. I don't think you were in my class. <laughs> but the, the togetherness that is brought about as a result of this round table is very much appreciated. And I think very much needed because our work is not over. In fact, when you start talking about racism and racial policy, we are getting it from the university, or I put it the other way around, from the White House to the university. And things are getting bad very quickly. And maybe if we get together, we can help stay some of what's happening off. Because it is destined right now to move us. And we, we, we want to have good dialogue. We want to have exchanges at our universities. Now, you know, things are not going well. Um, perhaps we can, at another conference, get together and talk about how knowledge production can move downward to high school students because by the time they get to college, many of them have already bought into the, the, the ideologies. And so certain kinds of programs we could do together. And very young kids understand a lot of what is going on. And with the technology that's available today, I think it, our responsibility is to move out of the classroom and do some outreach with citizens at every, every level. And I think this is a good opportunity for us to talk about it and to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Willard Johnson. He is Professor of Political Science Emeritus at MIT. Pro professor Johnson's interests cover a broad range of African and African American studies, from the politics of African development to aspects of African and African American history, culture, philosophy, and interethnic and foreign relations. His publications include The Cameroon Federation, Political Integration in a Fragmentary Society, and West African governments and volunteer development organizations. Johnson joined the ASA ahead of the 1968 annual conference in Los Angeles and was elected to the ASA board with Janetta B. Cole in 1970. 
However, they resigned soon thereafter when their resolution calling for the association to adopt a more politically active orientation towards the cause of African liberation was voted down by the membership. A founding member of the African Heritage Studies Association, Johnson's continued push for radical change within African studies also took expression in his tenure as co-chair with Emanuel Wallerstein of the newly formed Association of Concerned Africa Scholars between 1977 and 1991. In addition to helping found TransAfrica and the TransAfrican Forum, he is the founder of the Boston Pan-African Forum, which he remains actively involved in today. Welcome, Professor Willard Johnson. Yes, it is. Okay, good. Because it's harder for me to stand up. <laughs> anyway, I want to start actually by thanking not, not the ASA so much as the president of the ASA <laughs> from last year, <laughs> and previous to Pearl Robinson, who just came in because she did me the honor of organizing a couple of panels at last year's conference. And that was pitched in the frame of, of activist scholar, of scholar and activist set. That's my career. Um, and that's part of the point, I think, of what we're trying to, uh, to discuss here. Um, by the way, that um, part of my activism is to make sure that I try to get a video of all the presentations. <laughs> so I video my own uh, session, and it is now posted on the Boston Pan Africa Forum website. So I hope you will check that website out. B P A F B for Boston, P for Pan, <laughs> A for Africa, and F for Forum.org. And you'll see a lot of interesting things. Um, anyway, uh, let me start by saying that my own sense of the combination of activist scholarship uh, is akin to, I think, the approach taken by my very most noted colleague at MIT, Noam Chomsky who wrote a very important um, publication in the early 70s, but had been talking about it before that, and I had heard him speak on this, called The Responsibility of Intellectuals. And I did encourage you to, uh, to go to that and read it. But in that, he expresses the conviction that scholars have some responsibility to honor the humanity of those human subjects they study, and to honestly examine the causes of and their own relationship to these causes of the threats to and the damage of that humanity. And I believe that those who carried out the early rupture in ASA, and those of us who came to support that action and to carry forward uh, its implications were expressing that same conviction, that we have the obligation in doing our studies to honor the humanity of the people we are studying. So I think I and many other black activists and scholars felt that the conditions and challenges that Africa and Africans were facing in the 60s and the 70s, and that indeed continued long afterward, I would say, <coughs> we are all should be familiar with its continuing relevance were relevant to the plight of African Americans as well. That is to say, the fate of Africa and Africans was also very influential in the fate of African Americans. And 
that's one of the bases for African Americans saying we are an African people, which was one of the mantras in the 70s and especially the 80s. So that's true, I think, not only in terms of sentiment and self-appreciation, but also in the tangible and structural socioeconomic political terms. Um, this is all in present kind of understanding scaffold in its structural. The racism that we're experiencing is not simply cultural, it's reinforced by the whole socioeconomic political system. And that still has some influence over Africa itself. So there is a common scaffolding to the socioeconomic political circumstances of African Americans and Africans, and many of the hardships and abuses they each suffer have common roots and common ongoing sources. And that's what we must respond to. Um, let me say that in the late 60s and thereafter, I think we were trying to replace the Eurocentric framing of our study of Africa and in some sense of, of America. Because America did not begin with and end with pilgrims. <laughs> uh, so we need to see it in its larger context and its historical roots. So we were seeking to replace the Eurocentric frame with at least for African Americans and Afrocentric, and certainly for the study of Africa itself. So there was an emerging and reinforcing framework of understanding the commonality that all descendants of Africa have shared for centuries. And this led many African Americans to proclaim that they were an African people in the <coughs> This outlook was a component of, but not limited to, all of the relevant values in the goals of the Black Power Movement. And we could carry that right on into the Me Too. And uh, as Floyd Barber quoted Action and, and Alma Lynch in his book, The Black Seventies, quote, our new political theory and our new social order will be based on our own <coughs> theoretical formulations developed out of a need for solidarity. We are and will be concerned about loyalty, nurturing an atmosphere of love, and a sense of belonging. Brother Malcolm maintained that unity between Africans of the West and Africans of the fatherland will well change the course of history, and that we must return to African philosophically and culturally and develop more community and a framework of pan-Africanism. It's on that framework that we move, you know, out of the Montreal. I was asked by Andy Wallerstein, good friend, if I would be willing to run for the board of ASA <coughs> as a way of trying to deal with the structure and see if we could you know, bring the two forces back together. And I said I would do that uh, on one condition, that I would be able to run on a platform <laughs> as a candidate for the board. And uh, a bit later, I also said, and I want to recruit an associate to run with me. And that was Janetta Cole. Um, so, uh, and, and Manny was very progressive, honorable person who understood all of the things I just said. Um, so I ran on a 
platform called the Responsibility of Africanists. And let me read from some of that. Uh, I believe that scholars have a responsibility to seek out and expose truth and lies to the education of man. A society that honors scholars and certainly any association of them has the duty to facilitate such searches. I believe whites to be as capable as blacks to undertake such searches successfully, if they will, and I hold them both accountable to do so. Although intellectuals will certainly argue over that definition, enough of them will admit that when the power to shape reality is spread as unevenly as it is today, that was back then in 1971, it's still relevant, no such search will be adequate that does not seek out the elements of truth or falsehood with the wider rather than the more narrow meaning. Yet the truth is that the ASA has an organization and most of its members have been seeking and the kinds of searches that they have been permitted to conduct are hardly relevant to the profound and expansive truths about Africa and its peoples today, how they are and how they do at home and abroad. How many of us have been exposed to the spectacles of news photographers and newscasters rushing in to photograph or record the dying gas of some bullet-driven body in a riot on the campus or street or city? What contribution is made by a meticulously detailed account of how long the victim suffered, of how far the blood ran, of how many decibels the screen reached, how close to the gutter the victim fell. Where are the more profound truths that identify, identifies who shot him or her? Why and who continues to stand behind the hunters, giving them their weapons their hatred, their needs, their excuses, and their pardons relevant today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Our next speaker is Dr. Adrian Resnick. Uh, Dr. Resnick was the first PhD in economics with an African studies specialty in the United States and is the author of two books on Tanzania and numerous professional articles and papers on Africa. At the 1969 Montreal ASA meeting, he was the spokesperson for the White Radical Caucus that was supporting the Black Caucus and seized the microphone at the business meeting to read the White Caucus's demands, which included uh, calling for African studies programs and scholars to cut their ties with the U.S. government, especially USAID and the CIA. Subsequently, he was never able to secure a university appointment. Since Montreal, he has spent his career as an advisor to the Tanzanian government, director of various US and international advocacy and social action organizations, and currently is an author of fiction and non-academic nonfiction. Welcome, Dr. Resnick. Yeah. 
oh yeah, I've heard of it. Would you come? Uh, so when I got here, I've been running my mouth for the last 24 hours and saying, how come AOC is still doing this? How come you're still struggling with this? How come you haven't fixed this? And I have a way of you know, doing that, talking that way. But I listened also and I thought, this is a dialogue that's not occurring in the rest of the world. It's certainly not occurring in America. Uh, so in that sense, the ASA is miles ahead of everybody else. People are at least talking to each other. As far as I can see, people are listening to each other, and there's a, a degree of, of uh, humbleness that is the belief that I don't have to make any answers, and that somebody else does, and I'm willing to listen to it. Uh, it, it it's really refreshing for me. Uh, when I was five years old in Kansas, uh, I learned that there was a race problem in the United States. I learned there was a race problem in Wichita. Uh, I didn't know what Kansas was to be the world. But it, this stuck with me as I went along. I saw there was a race problem every place. Now, why it stuck with me, why this is important to me, is, is an enigma to me. I once tried to find out why white Peggy bourgeois intellectuals throw their their class interests away and align themselves with other people who have other interests, especially oppressed people. And uh, I thought there's a good article here. And I asked about 50, 60 people who were very progressive people. Uh, and everybody had an individual story. There was no commonality. And I hadn't found one to this day, so mine is it's irrelevant. Uh, the result is is what's important. So I, I brought that and all of the experiences and the work that I had done. I had come out of Tanzania by the time I got to Montreal. I had was on the faculty at Columbia and I had pushed the concept of, of changing the relationship of power in that case between the professor and the student to one of parallel power rather than hierarchical. As Tomo Prairie says, don't stand above uh, or in front, leading or behind, pushing both shoulder to shoulder. So I got that support. I, I got to Montreal. When I got there, a good friend who had been involved in the founding of the Union of Radical Political Economics at the, at the University of Michigan pulled me in to a room filled with white people. So you got to get in on this. So just to brief me, I, I, I knew nothing about it. Uh, Los Angeles. They didn't pay attention to the details of this kind of stuff. And um, there was politics in the room, and I was in politics. So what came out of it was a, a set of demands. And we immediately said, we're on the same page with the Black Caucus. But they weren't there. They didn't send us any messages. And we didn't send any messages to the past. What are you guys doing? And what do you want us to do? The big, the big hole in that process that we can get. So, set of demands, and somebody's got to present them uninvited to the plenary, and I don't know whether I raised my hand or stepped forward or was asked to do it, but I got a lot of those stuff. And uh, <laughs> all that. And my mirrors, the word mirrors, I love that. <laughs> and I waited uh, till a person finished. Man, I remember that from the mayor. I don't think I had at that time a hard time taking a mic out of a woman's hand. I don't know why. Uh, I took the mic out of the but they didn't rip it out. And I, I introduced myself and I said who we were and I, and I read these uh, demands. And I remember the look of shock, not awe, <laughs> on, on the faces of everybody, the 1500 or 600, whoever they were. They were all my bosses. My teacher, Elder Callum, was my boss at the time. And I remember a little thing in the back, back of my head, a little blip, maybe I made for a book, actually. Uh, I said, I think you might be making a mistake. <laughs> but I'm quite a push forward. Uh, Karina asked me to think about what, what was I thinking. For me, I was thinking about politics, I was politicizing. Uh, race was there, but the context of the political work that I've been involved in, uh, both in the academy and in the, the FF war movement, 
was basically white politics in America. And non-white and non-male uh, people with political issues barged in to this process. And they said, you want a lion here, you better give us a piece of the state. And in that process, I and I assume a lot of other people were educated. We learned about these issues. And uh, African Americans at Columbia and at the Pentagon and so forth, they educated in what, what was going on. So I had a sense as a white person that something really bad going on in America. But it wasn't happening to me. Uh, and that's really important. It was not happening to me. So I didn't get the division in Montreal, and I didn't get the division in the African Studies Association, and I didn't really get the division in the Academy. The difference between people with this oppression was happening to the discrimination, the whole, the whole enchilada. It was happening to them. It was their personal issue. And it wasn't my personal issue. I saw it politically as a thing which was electoral. It affected me. It created a world in which I found very unpleasant to live in. But I got to go home and do the laundry. I got to hang out with my kids. I got to do all the things that privileged white people get to do. And so I had liberal ideas in my head, but I didn't get clear that when I went into the supermarket. Uh, I never, never had anything in my face. I didn't get that at the time. So the alliance, I saw it as a political alliance. There were two groups trying to do basically the same thing. We didn't think that the African caucus went far enough. We thought they should go way beyond the issue of uh, participation, that they should make a political statement. We made a political statement about imperialism, about liberation of Southern Africa, about the failure of the African Studies Program. Uh, and uh, the African uh, Studies Association and the African States programs around the country to address these issues. We were not taught a thing about what was going on in Southern Africa. It just never came up when Patrice Lumumba was assassinated. I remember there was one African American guy from our program who set up a little table outside in the front entrance of Boston University collecting signatures. Uh, and all of, of us kind of walked by or signed it or didn't. Uh, we didn't know what was going on. And so when I got to Montreal, we, we were all said, this got to change. We got to integrate this into, in, into the education, into the process of research and, and African studies. I subsequently wrote an article where I personally uh, extended the demands uh, to the, the, the African studies and African American studies should be joined in the United States. And the ASA should lead that the fight uh, because it was impossible for the Africans needed to know about what was going on in the African American life in America and African Americans needed to know what was going on in Africa. Um, none of this had any impact. Uh, that's why we still fighting this fight. Um, but it was a time of confrontation. Those of you who didn't live in the 60s have no idea what those nine years from 1960 to 1969 were like. We had assassinations coming out of our ears. We had urban rebellions, huge conflagrations in, in, in Los Angeles and Newark. Washington uh, and more. Uh, we had institutions that were confronted. We had the whole university, Columbia University, and followed by more uh, that were taken out. One minute left. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. So uh, that was the, the idea of confronting and changing was uh, very familiar to me. So I was also asked, what does it mean to be an ally? Uh, and um, eventually, not at, in, through the ASA, but through work, successful work, I learned that uh, I believe that what it means to be an ally is to shift control, that control needs to be shifted out of the ally into the recipient or the partner. The partners have to be in control. They have to be able to say, you're done, we've had enough, go home. The last thing I want to say is that uh, the lesson for me personally of Montreal was to uh, see the difference between
principle is strange. I had thought up until that time that almost everything was a matter of principle. I thought the skinny going up that stage was a matter of principle. It was really a strategic choice, and it was probably the wrong strategic choice. I'm not sure the people that I supported were helped by my being tossed out of the I was struck with marginalized. Uh, I went and got into it another through another door. Uh, thanks for letting me share this. Thanks for letting me share this. Thank you, Dr. Reshman. So um, you will all notice that our wonderful um, colleague, Maicheri Mugo, is not here with us. She was not able to come at the very last moment. However, um, her colleagues, David Johnson and Michael West, prepared a statement, and I'm going to share that. Um, but I'll first just give you a brief introduction to um, Maicheri. She is an emeritus, uh, emeritus professor for teaching excellence at Syracuse University where she served as Chair of African American Studies, Director of the Africa Initiative, and Director of Graduate Studies. Micheri is a poet, playwright, and scholar whose numerous publications include writing and speaking from the heart of my mind, my mother's poem and other songs, and African orature and human rights. The recipient of Kenya's Elder of the Burning Spear Medal, Micheri is a committed activist who was once exiled from Kenya for advocating for human rights. And I'm now going to read the statement of David Johnson and Michael West. Philip D. Curtin's op-ed, Ghettoizing African History, targeted not the study of Africa generally, but the historical study of Africa specifically. The response was also tailored. While scholars of Africa from multiple disciplinary backgrounds entered the, the debate, it remained for black historians of Africa to offer a collective rebuttal to Curtin's claims. The responding black historians, along with many others, understood Curtin to say, among other things, that standards in African history were going down and that the decline was due to an increasing number of black scholars entering the field. Yet for many black historians of Africa, outrage was balanced by another emotion, fear. In some cases, fear seemed to overpower outrage. That is, fear that their careers could be retarded, perhaps even ruined for publicly criticizing Curtin. Many hinted darkly that African studies in the US Academy, especially African historical studies, was thickly populated by a network of Curtin's colleagues, former students, and associated loyalists, and that these individuals exercised overwhelming influence in numerous career-determining decisions, including tenure and promotion, access to certain journals and book series, and fellowships like SSRC and Fulbright. Consequently, the narrative went, one crossed this network at one's own peril. The extent to which these uh, perceptions comported with reality was never clear. That, however, was academic. In politics, including academic politics, perception invariably trumps reality. And the perception of many a black historian of Africa was that Curtin's boys, the favorite term for the reputed network, were omnipresent in the upper reaches of African studies, with near omnipotent authority to make or break careers in the field. No one bothered to mention the racial background of Curtin's boys, it being generally understood that this group consisted largely, if not exclusively, of white males. Whatever the merits or lack thereof, such anxieties were palpable and pervasive. Of course, such concerns have hardly been confined to the academy. Not for nothing was, was one of the iconic events of the US civil rights strug struggle dubbed the March Against Fear. In these circumstances, rounding up signatures for a collective response by black historians of Africa a, a broth concocted by many cooks, too many it seems at times, proved to be a daunting task. Some of those who initially promised to sign it or express interest in doing so suddenly went incommunicado at the last moment. Others sought safety in numbers and political cover. While willing to sign, they wanted to be assured that certain others, usually someone of note in the field, had also committed to signing or had already done so. All the same, 50 self-identified black historians of Africa eventually appended their signatures to the document deconstructing Curtin's op-ed. Distressing though it was, however, collecting the signatures for the written response was the easy part. A much greater challenge emerged when a decision was made to organize a plenary session on the Curtin affair at the upcoming meeting of the African Studies Association in Orlando later that same year, 1995. Crucially, Professor Curtin agreed to appear in person to participate in the exchange. The question then became who would take the lead in publicly confronting him before so conspicuous and august an assembly, namely the entire ASA conference in session. 
There was broad consensus that a senior black historian of Africa, a person of some stature in the field, preferably a full professor with a willingness to make do with an associate professor in a pinch, should be, one of the, should, should be the one to appear opposite Curtin at the planned forum. Alas, no such person could be found. Some of those suggested for the assignment did not plan to be in Orlando. Other prospective respondents were indeed planning to attend the conference, but hastened to pass on the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face engagement with Curtin. Seemingly, the professor and his boys were still casting a long shadow of trepidation. This is where my Cherry Mugu came in. She too was not planning to be in Orlando, nor was she, by academic training, a historian, no matter. A literary scholar, she did meet a key criterion for spearheading the response to Curtin. She was a senior professor and a person of status in the field. No less important, she did not flinch when asked to assume the role. A veteran of multiple marches against spear, literal and figurative, in and out of the academy in multiple countries and continents, Mugo responded to the call to duty with refreshing alacrity. There was just one hurdle. Although uh, possessed of a willing spirit, she was a single mother of two girls. Her hurdle readily overcome through the usual collective endeavor, Harambe, so to speak. She was good and ready to go to Orlando. And that was a bravura of a performance she gave on arrival there, proving, if further proof was necessary, that literary producers are the most authentic truth tellers, which is to say, historians of global African experiences. In addition to Mugo and Curtin, the panel participants included Edward Alpers and the present writers, uh, one of them David Johnson as a speaker and the other Michael West as moderator. But Mugo's electrifying refutation of Curtin received with acclamation by those of African descent in the audience, though less so by their European, their Euro-American fellow conferees, the racial disparity was evident for all to see, was easily the highlight of the exchange. A senior black scholar in the audience reported that, at the end of the event, a senior white colleague turned to him and said, referring to the present writers, uh, that is David Johnson and Michael West, then both professor, uh, assistant professors, they just committed harikari. This assertion, reportedly coming from someone not self-evidently a curtain boy, seemed to give credence to the anxieties and fears that had gripped so many of those seeking to calibrate their responses to the hornet's nest Curtin's op-ed uh, had stirred up. At Orlando, a powerful and poignant rebuke was delivered to the claims contained in that document. The, the deliverer was my cherry Mugo. For all of those, uh, for all of those uh, desirous of a more open and inclusive African studies, she did us proud. Amen. I'm now going to uh, introduce Dr. Alan Isaacson. He is the Regents Professor of History at the University of Minnesota, extraordinary professor at the University of the Western Cape, and past president of the ASA. He's the author of numerous books, including Dams, Displacement, and the Delusion of Development with Barbara Isaacson, and Mozambique, the Africanization of a European Institution, the Zambezi um, Prazos both of which won the Herskovitz Prize, which uh, Isaacman says should be renamed. <laughs> Throughout his career, he has been dedicated to politically engaged scholarship, a commitment that dates back to his work with Frilimo, both during the armed struggle and after independence in Mozambique. He is currently at work with, uh, with Barbara Isaacman on a biography of Samora Michelle, Mozambique's first president. Of all his accomplishments, the one he is proudest of is training more than 50 graduate students many of whom have gone on to play important leadership roles in Southern Africa and the US. They include the first black South African chair of the history department at the University of Witzwaterrand, the first African dean of the humanities at WITS, and a MacArthur Genius Award recipient. Welcome, Dr. Isaacman. It's a great honor to be here and with all these wonderful, committed, uh, active scholars whose life histories demonstrate that activism and political engagement and scholarship are inextricably intertwined rather than in opposition to each other, as is the pillar curtains of the world uh, went to us to believe. When Jeannie asked me to uh, speak, I wasn't sure what contribution that I could make. I had just returned from Mozambique, from colonial Mozambique, and had seen the work of Portuguese oppression. I went to Montreal and joined and watched the board of 
in Vienna and was part of the uh, White Caucus, uh, but didn't play a particularly consequential role. On the other hand, when I got back to me, uh, to Wisconsin, so I'm part of that curtain network, uh, or the victim of that part of that curtain <laughs> network, but not it. I didn't pay a heavy price, like many of my colleagues did. I want to be very, very clear about that. Uh, I was asked to, uh, to debate Curtin about what happened in Montreal because much of many of the members and most of the students didn't go. And quite frankly, I was terrified for all the reasons that we uh, talked about. Curtin could be and was a very powerful and a very vindictive person. And above all else, what Curtin, Curtin thought that anything he thought was right because he thought it. So, and that's, that is what this is all about, is about the power of this, this man and the legacy of Erskine that Gene had told him about yesterday to name and define and colonize the whole field and colonize and cheer on large numbers of people. In any case, uh, I happen to be married to a very strong and wonderful woman who's not here right now, Bobby. I just think she says, oh, no big deal. He just, just do it. So I just did it, and he was, of course, pissed. <laughs> but I was very lucky. I mean, I want to be very, very clear about that, that there was another senior African, this guy had been senior there, and he served as my guardian and my protector. So I had the advantage of great privilege, and I also had the advantage of having a counter force to Curtin. Now, uh, Curtin and a couple of other senior African then became very angry at me at the ASA in 1973 after I said publicly that I was not donating the, the money that I received the first of its awards for Lima. And uh, it was completely inappropriate. That was the notion of the objective scholar. But I want to be very clear. It's not the role that I play that significant. And, what, and the reason I agreed to, to talk is because Karina pointed out that in my presidential address in 2001, I talked about engaged scholars who were intimidated, silenced, and marginalized by the power, by the curtains of this world. But not only the curtains, but when Gwen Carter, Leonard Thompson, the handful of people who controlled and colonized the whole field and tried to colonize uh, <coughs> the production of knowledge about Africa in the name of, of Africa. But I, so I want to just move very briefly and acknowledge the enormous price that individuals who engage scholars pay, the enormous price they pay individually, and the enormous price the associations pay uh, because of the silence. And I just want to give four or five examples. Some of the people are here. I apologize if I embarrass you. It's not my intention at all. And, and it's certainly not my intention to lionize you, but rather just to acknowledge the incredibly important role that you play. Beginning, of course, with E.J. and Mark to, to my left, uh, who I'm not sure has always been to my left, but certainly <laughs> <laughs> on the same, on the same, in the same place, um, and who, who you heard his whole career. He paid a heavy price because of the Elder Cowan and the uh, William O. Browns. Who, uh, if you remind me of who the president was, the director of Hacks and Studies Association, who had worked for the CAA. And this was not only about race politics, but it was about race thinking, but it was also about anti colonialism, anti imperialism, hierarchy, because not only were African American distinguished scholars not permitted to be fellows, but those of us who happened to be white and were not uh, uh, presumed to be. Uh, significant enough yet to join this high esteemed group of college, we were not voting members this evening. So it was a very authoritarian as well as racist organization. So, but people like each of paid a very high price. My dear friend and colleague, Joe Samoff, who was uh, in the audience right now and uh, who was a, went to the University of Michigan and did a PhD in political science. He was a very strong supporter of the Black Students' Union at the University of Michigan and ran into the power of number one, number of the other great guardians of the, of the gate, Ali Masrui. And as a result, Joel did not get tenure. Joel, Joel uh, 
has continued to teach curriculum in Africa and to study education and development, uh, but a lot of these things had to do with first freelancing and consulting and then with uh, a position, but not uh, a formal, full, regular position at Stanford. Uh, Prexy Nesbitt, who uh, uh, he, uh, he takes a very, very heavy practice towards Northwestern. Uh, it was at the time he arrived after Gwendolyn Carter uh, was no longer there, I believe, but she had established a culture that was paternalistic toward Africans and not about human blacks, and Prexy was an active, activist and just was interested for everything that uh, uh, she opposed and, rep and he represented everything that she opposed. He never finished and we paid a very heavy price for that. And then I will make a passing reference to very distinguished scholars who even though they're very, very prominent in the field, had their reputations in some ways sullied by Curtin in that obnoxious and horrible characterization uh, <coughs> statement. And that is my former student, Elias Mandala, and my colleague and dear, uh, dear friend, Sandra Green. And so, so Curtin's reaction, in part, in that ghettoizing article comes because he saw his power diminished or destroyed. It was subverted by excellence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and what, motivated, what motivated Curtin, what motivated Curtin was his inability to place one of his students at the University of North Carolina. And after all, it was a superior white student at competing against Sandra Green, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, our former president, and also Elias Mandela, a very distinguished scholar from the University of Rochester. So look at what we pay. Look at the price we pay, and we continue to pay it today. So I thank Jean and Karina for organizing this event. And we as sort of, as we begin to approach Willard and I and, and uh, Dr. Lewis and others, begin to uh, approach middle age. <laughs> <laughs> to watch you guys make this the organization and the association that we hope we were able to make it. We haven't done a great job, but at least on Jean's leadership, we've opened the space for really new and forthright conversation across race, about cross gender, Course class about issues of power, the power to name, and the role that we can play to help liberate Africa in this larger and hostile global world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sandra E. Green. Uh, she's the Stephen 59 and Madeline 60 Ann Binder Professor of African History at Cornell University and an elected member of the Ambrosiana Academy in Milan, Italy and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research interests have ranged widely from the history of gender and ethnic relations during the era of the Atlantic slave trade to the history of sacred sites and indigenous slavery in West Africa. Her groundbreaking first book, Gender, Ethnicity, and Social Change on the Upper Slave Coast, was followed by three other single authored books and numerous co-edited collections, including the five volume New Encyclopedia of Africa, winner of the 2008 Connor Reporter Prize, and the two volume series African Voices on Slavery and the Slave Trade. She is past president of the ASA, has served on the board of editors of the American Historical Review, and is presently serving her second term as chair of the history department at Cornell University. Welcome, Sandra Green. If I feel a little bit tired, it's because I'm just crawling to the end of my term as chair. <laughs> so, um, um, uh, it's wonderful to be able to be invited to this event and to learn so much. Uh, everyone knows about, I mean, certainly I knew about 1969, but none of the kind of details, and more importantly, the kind of statistical information that was provided by Jeannie at her presidential lecture in terms of where we have come and how far we still have to go. So I'd like to uh, follow up the lead of, of uh, Shelby and Ivy and to say a little bit more about myself in terms of my background. 
And that is, I grew up in Zinni, Ohio, which was in uh, southwest Ohio, uh, not that far from the Kentucky border, so it was very much still influenced by Southern culture. Zinni, Ohio was also, is also the home of Google Force University and Central State University, two uh, historically black uh, colleges and universities, which had a major impact on my uh, interest in Africa. Um, as Shelby was saying, she rejected the notion that uh, Euro-Americans would be more welcome in Africa than African-Americans. Uh, I knew that because <coughs> living, up, living in and growing up near two HBCUs, they have historically had a lot of African students coming through. Since the 19th century, there have been links between African-Americans and Africans supporting each other, providing educational opportunities to each other. And it's there that I met a number of African students. Uh, uh, my mother, after having uh, us three daughters, went back to school. Martin Luther King was her keynote speaker at her graduation. And there were many different people who came, both prominent African Americans as well as Africans, who spoke at Central State University. Uh, of course, I was growing up in the mid-60s, and a lot of exciting things were going on in Africa in terms of independence. And so it's that point that I decided I, too, wanted to go. I wanted to go to Africa. And so I looked around. My father said, you're not going to go any place more than 150 miles <laughs> So within that radius, college, I found Kalamazoo College, which is one of the earliest colleges that started sending students to study abroad in Africa. So I spent a year in Ghana, uh, connected with some of the uh, Ghanaians who had actually been to Kalamazoo. Uh, and so they, in a sense, became my Ghanaian family before I actually married a Ghanaian. <laughs> and then... <laughs> to Northwestern, finish my PhD, et cetera. My involvement and, and interest, particularly in this town, as indicated by Alan, was that um, in 1970, no, sorry, 1992, 93 is when Duke University was advertising for a position in African history. I had recently moved from Kalamazoo to Cornell when I was contacted and asked to apply. So I said, okay, why not? So uh, I threw my hat in the ring, I went through the interview, it went very well. Uh, Elias Mandela was another candidate uh, who may have also been contacted and actually invited to apply. In the end, the position was offered to me. I ended up deciding to stay at Cornell, and I think Elias probably decided to stay at Rochester. But uh, this is the background behind Curtin's article in the Chronicle of Higher Education that one African-American and one African was offered a position at what was considered to be one of the most prestigious <coughs> universities in the country and, and shut out what he considered to be his more well-qualified white students. Uh, so he put this um, uh, editorial, wrote this editorial on the back page of the Chronicle of of higher education, I was also very involved with organizing the response uh, with Michael West, David Johnson, and a, a group of others. The Chronicle couldn't publish all the people who uh, signed that letter, so my name never appeared, uh, but I was very involved in the organization of that letter. And then, of course, Curtin was invited. I know that uh, on his way to that particular meeting, uh, some of his white colleagues were saying, do you really want to do this, you know? And he said, well, I stuck my foot in it, so I guess I have to go ahead and do it. And the response at the meeting was, it was very emotional, as I already indicated uh, by Michael and David's, uh, Johnson's uh, uh, statement about the charity. There was a lot of outrage, there was a lot of fear, but there was also a sense of betrayal because Curtin had worked with a lot of African scholars, especially in Senegal. 
and for them to be characterized as intellectually inferior to any of his white students was deeply painful and hurtful. So the session was packed, uh, but not only was the session organized in a particular kind of way, but we also decided that this was the time for the African and African American scholars to get together. So shortly after, I don't think very many people know this, shortly after uh, the session with Curtin, where he had to respond to uh, the larger audience, you know, of African and African American scholars, and there were a lot of white people there, um, the African and African American scholars got together and said, okay, we need to organize ourselves in this context. And there was a lot of discussion, et cetera. Uh, and one of the issues of discussion and debate was, should we walk out? Should we do like we did in 1969? Let's just leave. And at that point, I said, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> if anybody's going to leave, it's going to be white people who leave. <laughs> decided to resign from the organization. But we continue on, and um, clearly there continues to be a struggle. And so I want to urge everyone to take the information that Jeannie provided, not only the historical background, but all the charts, and to see how serious the problem continues to be. Volunteer to be on some of these committees. Get involved in the organization, and let's make a change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, I am pleased now to introduce Professor Michael Gomez. He is the Silver Professor of History and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University, and the director of NYU's newly established Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora. He served as the founding director of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora, or OSWAD, as it is fondly known, from its inception in 2007, uh, sorry, its uh, inception in 2000 to 2007, and is uh, the founding editor of Cambridge University Press's Cambridge Studies on the African Diaspora series. He has chaired the history departments at both NYU and Spelman College, and also served as president of UNESCO's International Scientific Committee for the Slave Route Project from 2009 to 2011. He is the author of books too numerous to mention in their entirety here, but audience members will no doubt recognize him as the author of the brilliant Exchanging Our Country Marks, The Transformation of African Identities in the Colonial and Antebellum South, and most recently, African Dominion, A New History of Empire in Early and Medieval West Africa. I welcome you, Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Dr. Ray. I'm going to stand because uh, uh, not because I want to be seen, but there's some folks on this side of the room that I want to see. <laughs> Morning to everybody. Morning. Uh, well, I want to make clear that I'm here because uh, Gene Allman asked me to be here. I'm not a frequent uh, uh, attendee of the ASA for reasons which will become clear maybe. Uh, but. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to see a number of people uh, that I know, and I'm hoping that you will uh, make sure we see each other after the session. Uh, the queries that were put to me by Dr. Ray, and I, I thank you for chairing, for chairing this panel, uh, boil down into two uh, areas. One. Um, what's the genesis of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora and to what has been my uh, experience at the ASA. So I want to talk about the first. Um, the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora emerged um, in relationship or in response to the growing literature on uh, the African diaspora variously uh, uh, characterized as the Black Atlantic, African diaspora, global, Af global Africa, and so forth. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an important 
uh, development and from my perspective, uh, it uh, constituted a field in its own right that needed um, uh, uh, space within which scholars involved uh, in, in that study could convene on a regular basis. And um, had been talking with, had been in some uh, conversations with some individuals about that. Um, in particular, um, my dear friend and late uh, uh, colleague Sterling Stuckey, uh, who, with whom I collaborated uh, in trying to think through the process of how to bring forward uh, this this study, this association. So I want to make clear that first and foremost, um, ESWAT began to be envisioned uh, as an intellectual endeavor. Now, uh, I would be dishonest to not also recognize that the, there was another context in which um, ASWAD uh, was developing, and that was the ASA. And um, let's see. I think that, so I took the PhD in 1985. I thought, I think I began actually uh, um, attending ASA conferences a little bit before then. Uh, from 85 to 95, I think I was at every one of them. Uh, 95 was the culture. And uh, it's been discussed. Uh, so uh, with that conference in uh, Orlando, I think it was, was uh, quite, a, quite a deal. And it was very confusing for me individually because I had, uh, in fact, um, uh, Philip Curtin had shared uh, a lot of his material with me uh, because at that time I was working in um, Eastern Senegal. And uh, I was working at Spelman College. I had a colleague, um, uh, uh, Maceo Daly, who also passed away a couple of years ago, who invited uh, Curtin to come. And Curtin, I think he spent about a month at Spelman. And uh, we, you know, so you know, I mean, we were, you know, we were, we were having meals every day and talking. And so I knew nothing about uh, 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 Dr. Curtin's background, and so he seemed to be a fine fellow to me. <laughs> and uh, and so, and so, you know, I'm sitting in the front at this, at this, in this plenary in Orlando. I was sitting next to Bubba Kabara, who became my uh, my mentor. And I was just floored. What is going on? And uh, so um, I want to say that I very much respect the decisions that um, uh, Sandra Green and others made with respect to moving the ASA forward. Uh, I was not participatory in, in those meetings. Don't remember being invited, but that's okay. Um, uh, I think so, and, and the work is very important, and, and it's important that ASA continues, continues to go on, and it looks like you've, you've done a fine job. I made a different decision, I'm wired differently, and uh, decided, well, you know, this may be the moment to begin to do something different, uh, not in competition with ASA, but just to move in a different direction. And uh, indeed, um, uh, ASWAT has developed um, we met uh, in Rio, Barbados, uh, Accra, uh, Sevilla, uh, I don't know where else, uh, Dominican Republic, so forth. And it's not so much, hopefully it's not uh, a project that focuses on African American scholars or scholarship as it relates to diaspora, but rather um, I see it as a project that, that hopefully engenders and really decenters the U.S. In uh, the in the you know uh, in the study of the African diaspora, which is a huge. I mean, this is a very important. I mean, this is you know the scholarship that's developing uh, in multiple languages is very very important, uh, and it is and from my perspective, directly and deeply connected to the study of Africa. I don't see these as separate kinds of uh, trajectories, and so. Um, yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, in attending the ASA, I, I, you know, just speaking anecdotally, anecdotally, 
mm, inviting and welcoming are not terms that I would use to characterize my experience uh, with respect to the, to the atmosphere at ASA. Uh, I, I, this is purely, this could be solely subjective, maybe there's something wrong with me, and so I'm perfectly uh, willing to accept that. Lots of really, really wonderful people in the ASA, uh, people with whom I, I have, I'm, I'm friends, and so uh, you know, I connect in, you know, individual to individual, with, but with respect to the association, I've, I've, you know, my sense is that people were uh, curious that I was uh, participatory in the association, some were hostile, some were amused. And I just decided to do something different. And so I want to underscore, however, that a number of people who are scholars of, of Africa have been and continue to be um, involved with ASWAT. Uh, I just want to name some of them. Abu Nabusia, Jean Allman, who was our treasurer. Uh, Lisa Aubrey, Buba Kabari, Carol Boyce Davey, Shukiel Hamill, John Hunwick, Abiola Irele, the late Abiola Irele, San Stanley James, Pat Manning, Joe Miller, Richeri Mugo, Elise Simone, uh, Filomeno Steady, Ibrahim Sunjata, Sheila Walker, Wando Achebe, Ben Talton, Karina Ray, been involved. Uh, Bosa de George, I've seen her at a few conferences. Uh, so, uh, Lansene Kaba, uh, Richard Joseph was at one of those conferences. I saw, there you go. Okay, so uh, Robert Trent Vinson, Ben Talton, and so forth and so on. So, a lot of people are involved in it. And um, so, I don't know, maybe there are ways we can collaborate. I don't, I don't have anything else to do with this. So, but I, I don't run things, you know, I, you know, my day is done. Uh, but I do go to the conferences, and uh, so maybe there are you know, areas in which uh, the two associations can collaborate, I don't know, but, it's, but ASWAT is, is growing and developing, and uh, I think we did a good thing. And so uh, in retrospect, um, you know, Orlando was generative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. Finally, but definitely so, uh, definitely not the least, I am very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Koswa Adamaka Ampofo. Uh, she's Professor of African and Gender Studies at the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana. At the heart of her work as an activist scholar are questions of identity and power within families, institutions, political and religious spaces, and the knowledge industry. Her current work on black masculinities explores the shifting nature of identities among black men in Africa and the diaspora. In 2015, she presented the African Studies Review Distinguished Lecture, subsequently published in the ASR in 2016, as reviewing studies on Africa, hashtag Black Lives Matter, and envisioning the future of African studies. She is co-editor of the Transatlantic Feminisms, Women's and Gender Studies in, African, in Africa and the Diaspora, she has served as the foundation director of the University of Ghana's Center for Gender Studies and Advocacy, and as the director of the Institute of African Studies. Adamako Ampofo is, is a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, editor-in-chief of the Contemporary Journal of African Studies, co-editor of the African Studies Review, and the Critical Investigations into Humanitarianism in Africa blog. She is president of the African Studies Association of Africa. Welcome, Dr. Adamako Ampopo. Um, thank you very much, um, Karina, and of course, Jean, for inviting me onto this panel. It's been a privilege to be with such distinguished um, individuals, and I've remembered this for a long time. I just want to say to Jean that um, we would say, we are in Papa. To which she's real human being. Um, and Karina says this out very elegantly and asked me a um, very reflective question. It was basically to talk about the African Studies Association of Africa, why now, and how we might um, collaborate with each other. Uh, let me say that I've been a member of the ASA, I think from probably 95 or 96. I came here in the late 90s um, to do my PhD. 
and the ASA has given me my letter to go home. I, f I came in here and found um, a lot of support, a lot of warmth. The Women's Caucus and the Ghana Servants Council, then now Ghana Servants um, Association, and I've, I've been in these places um, all this while. It took me a couple of years being within the ASA to know about, to know even tangentially about uh, what my colleagues on the table here um, have said this morning. But um, at, at some point, I, I began to ask myself, why are the African Americans? And they're not in this space, and then I began to understand the history. Um, the, the formation of the African Studies Association of Africa is not a new thing. That we were formed this new activation, I should say. Um, in 2013, when the Institute of African Studies celebrated its 50th anniversary. But there have been prior attempts, and I need to say that there was a Congress in 1962, which was, um, and there was a steering committee that, okay, Onuke uh, uh, Ike facilitated that in uh, 1962. It was held at the University of Ghana. Later on, some of the other people pre present were Manako Nakitia. Um, from Ghana, Cizera from the Antilles, Cizero from the upper world at the time, Abokina Faso, Akilio Kapte from Ethiopia, Budiba from Tanzania, Wakule from Congo, Otieno from Kenya, Yop from Senegal, Koman from the US, and there were other representatives from France, the UK, and the USSR. And they formed an international congress of um, African studies and set up statutes. But that didn't get to happen, and I am still trying to understand the experience here that you probably will know much better than I do. But the, the, the story is very complicated, and we don't really know what um, all that happened. But since then, there have been conversations among many of us, and maybe the case of this was a meeting, um, a pedestrian meeting, maybe some seven or eight years ago, I can't remember exactly when, in, um, in Morocco, at which Chitwami. Former director and sister colleague invited and um, introduced me to Mr. Sadeta, who just was at the University of Cape Town and said, You guys have been talking about the same things in different spaces. And um, then the ASA was formed subsequently at um, the University of Ghana in 2013. There were several meetings between um, a few of us, in both at Cape Town and Africa. Now, at a basic level, one is looking for a space where we can do this unfinished business. Right? When uh, the University of Ghana set up, or the Institute of African Studies was set up at the University of Ghana, Juan Makoma gave us a charge. And um, being a, what did he say? Something about strategy and uh, strategy and principle. So I, I, I guess Sintoma was kind of juggling that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, OK, we'll have an Institute of African Studies. You guys go out and change the rest of the university because obviously, you know, it was clear to some people that having a university on African soil did not necessarily make it an African university. <laughs> and so the charge that the Koma gave to us was to do a study of African peoples from an African centered way. And he specifically said to decolonize it from the ways in which kind of people Jean talked about and we've heard about this morning and did African studies and to do that very consciously and to make that um, our endeavor. That hasn't happened um, quite the way that it should have, and um, I'm, I'm not proud to say that sometimes, yeah, the University of Ghana, we teach an introductory course in draft classes that every student has to take otherwise they don't graduate. Um, I'm not proud to say that sometimes I go into the classroom, these are our first or second year students, and um, you ask them, you know, who was the only boys, Few times will go up, and you know that he's buried in Accra, and you go there one or two times. So we've we've gone down though in, in certain uh, respects, and of course uh, neoliberal, and we can't unpack that concept here. But we began to do um, higher education in, uh, in very different ways. Uh, at the same time, myself and some of us coming from the continent to the ASA didn't find that warmth and reception necessarily from outside the spaces, for example, that have been happy with the Women's Caucus and Women's Association, and sometimes even within those spaces. So um, you would sometimes experience a sense of entitlement from colleagues um, within the ASA, or 
often quite colleagues in conversations about things that we are coming to Ghana next year to do really and see, and almost so former, um, not in the sense of well, what do you think about it? Um, I'm bringing in students for study abroad, will you do a lecture for me? Might you think about constructing this together, perhaps? <laughs> um, happened very rarely, and I, and I should say, um, my friend and colleague, Joseph Bioto Betsu, did a women's study, study abroad program uh, at the University of Ghana, and we designed and built this together from the beginning to the end. Who would teach? What readings would be on there? What did we want to get out of it? So there were not many of those, and um, this. You know, expectation that people would parachute in, assemble Ghanaian colleagues, and then they would um, leave. It began to be very uncertain for me. Um, in other spaces, we've talked about the ways, I think, um, as a few said this year, about the way there's a perception that, um, you know, the, the, the Africans on the continent would be the data collectors, and the theory would be done at consensus colleagues here. And again, you know, as people on this table have said, this was coming from people who were not even on that, who knew. So you're like, you know, uh, why are you doing this? And then the disappointment in looking at people's course outlines. And it's like, you worked with me for six, seven years, you know I've done A, B, and C. How does that never appear on your course outline as something that you would want um, your students um, to look at? Um, and then, of course, in coming to the ASA, and I will definitely continue coming to the ASA because this is definitely one of my homes, but for many, and I happen to be one of those people who carry a passport that allows me to travel um, much more easily in this world. But for many of my colleagues, just getting a visa to come here, we know many people who are not here today because they have not their visa, and it's becoming increasingly difficult. So, for all these and, and other reasons, um, it was important to have a space um, that was our own. So just very quickly, some of the things that we expect to have in that space. Of course, it's a professional home as well. And there are challenges that we go through as people within the academy, but of course, we also expect to have a lot of access within the association in terms of tenure, in terms of academic freedom. And we are the only ones who can really work with that for each other. And we need to be doing that. We need a, a space where our students can see that our work Continental Africans is valorized and respected and have access to that. Um, we want our, our students also to be proud of us as, as senior scholars and not to think that, well, if you haven't cited you know, from these prominent uh, Northern scholars that our own university is obviously privileged and where you know, in these locations that we are pushed to um, publish in. You guys are doing good things. And, and more and more we are hearing that because of social media and the internet. So they can be proud of us. And, and that is also that's important for them as well as for us. And of course, they need to know um, the history. And we need a space where we can run the organization, where we have the power. So um, Karina asked me um, ways in which we could collaborate. And I find that very important. We're a very young organization. We need a lot of mentoring, we need a lot of capacity building, but it needs to be done in a respectful manner and where the mentor is listening to the prospective or the, the mentee. There are many things that we can learn about organizing conferences, um, the journal, the competitions about how the ASR can mentor some of the journals on the continent. Um, and for myself, this has also been um, a learning experience, and I'm taking what I've learned from um, being on the ASR into the contemporary journal studies. And not repeating the mistakes that have happened with the ASA, because it, it's not like those of us on the continent are, I mean, we're human beings, okay? So we are, we're not immune from the ego and the pride and the power of struggles, and indeed, um, ASA has already been experiencing some of that. And so we need that space that we can grow, but we do need the, the support from the ASA. We, we do, we do we need that space. And um, for myself personally, I want to see a whole lot more of a collaboration between continental 
improve, but also work fantastic body that are those of you and the dads also work on that collaboration. So you know, work that looks at the ways in which these these are one family and not just two pieces of single family. And so this is and I'd like to end by you know, listening to all that people have said here and the activism that has gone on and the, the heavy price that people have paid and the ways in which many of us are very comfortable today and thinking about our careers and where we will go and the names that we will make. It's important for us to do that social justice work. Um, and I read somewhere that, you know, speak out and do even if your voice shakes and you're afraid, you know, just say it. Um, so I will end by saying that we can't do this without each other. The children have a saying that I'm well if you are well. You can't be well alone. We need to do it together. Thank you, Dr. Adamato and Coco.